Are you excited? It's Thursday, almost Friday, right? So ready for the weekend. But you know, one thing important before the weekend is that we have to learn more about the hardware accelerators before we can go for the weekend. So, um, well, but again, right, we want to set you at a stage why we are talking about hardware accelerators. And the main reason is because if you look at the current programming model, uh, it's pretty much like uh, we rely on this, uh, processing unit to perform our algorithms. However, uh, many, many important applications that we are looking into today, especially those machine learning ones, their operational intensity is really high. And, no, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the memory technology doesn't allow us to uh, enlarge the bandwidth too fast. So it turns out the only thing we can do is probably, OK, uh, well, uh, if, well mm, OK, so. I got it wrong, okay, again, right? So a lot of applications are actually uh, still bounded by uh, the computation resource. So it turns out that the only solution we should focus on for this applications at that point is probably finding faster hardware to execute the main algorithm of those applications. So for example, LSTM or CNN, uh, they are really uh, operational intense. So it turns out that, well, even though you give it a uh, very, very good memory, a large amount of memory, very fast memory doesn't help that much because the main thing is that we cannot compute stuff fast enough. So a lot of people, uh, if they don't have this idea of uh, operational intensity or if they don't have the idea of a roof line model, they might misunderstand uh, where in my system should be uh, optimized. So with this roof line model, it's clearly shown that uh, for uh, for models like CNN or LSTM, at least at some degree, it's more compute intensive uh, than you could ever imagine. So turns out uh, CPU is not enough, so people start to seek for other units like GPU. But as you know, GPU is still not fast enough, so that's why we have hardware accelerators. So it turns out because we have to run these applications every day, so our computer is pretty much a combination of a set of accelerators nowadays. So it's so common that you see uh, AI accelerators, you see GPUs, you see uh, 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 CPUs all in your system. And uh, one of the, uh, so we have been talking about GPUs. However, uh, TPU is only one implementation of this AI ML accelerators. And uh, in fact, NVIDIA also they have their response to the TPU. And that's, that has been part of the uh, NVIDIA Turing architecture as we saw in the last lecture. However, is AI ML workloads the only kind of workloads we care about? 
probably not, right? Like a lot of us are so fascinated about um, the reality stuff, like virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. And uh, believe it or not, I don't know how many of you fall in this category, but uh, at my age, a lot of people want to pick uh, computer science as, the ma as their major. Has nothing to do with AI ML, but has more to do with I want to be a game creator, right? And then we realize that, okay, the game creator is probably not a good job because they are low pay, they are over time, but we, and we all find some other things that's more interesting than creating game. Uh, and sometimes, um, okay, um, an interesting story is that when something uh, okay, some people are saying that I want to pick my favorite thing as a job, as my career, right? And it turns out that uh, once you started to do that, you lose one thing you love, <laughs> right? So uh, people would rather be a gamer instead of a game creator. Like I have a friend work in uh, Activision Blizzard. Uh, he never played Blizzard game after work <laughs> because he said, I have enough. All right, so that's pretty much telling you, right? Sometimes uh, that's why people would rather be a gamer instead of a game creator. Okay, but set it aside, right? Gaming is very important, right? And reality, like these applications, we are so fascinated by that. Sometimes, right, uh, although this is rare in California, but sometimes it's a raining day, right? The only thing, or for, uh, I don't know how many of you are from like the northeastern part of the United States, but the winter is so long, right? So. The only thing you can do is stay at home. So people really want to have, create like a reality scenario, like, okay, even though I'm in Boston, I can still travel to San Diego uh, virtually, right? And uh, <laughs> interesting, so there was, one, uh, there was one long weekend, I asked my, a friend of mine, like, okay, like, what are you going to do? He said, I will stay at home all day. And I say, How, is that funny? And he is like responding to me, like, okay, I can use Google Earth from here to like, you know, like the Bay Area, wrong, right? So reality is very important. So, uh, and one important thing to support the reality is the ray tracing algorithm. So, uh, but, uh, okay, so last week we talked, well, last lecture we talked about tensor cores, and now we are going to talk about another type of accelerators existing in the Turing architecture. That is RT cores, and the RT stays, uh, for, stands for ray tracing. So what is ray tracing? So uh, the basic, okay, so don't, don't blame me too much because I'm not a computer graphics guy, but this is the very, very basic idea about ray tracing. So the very, very basic idea of ray tracing is that consider this is your eye, and your eye could be, a, or, or sometimes people say camera, right? And this place is like a, like a, like a, like a plan where your image should be laying on, right? So this is probably the, your, based on your view angle, this is, you can consider that as a window, for example, right? And through that window, uh, uh, from your eyes, you will shoot a lot of rays. So this is probably your viewpoint, and depending on how many pixels you have on your screen, that's probably the amount of rays that uh, you, would, you, would, you would generate from this source. And for each ray, we uh, pretty much trace it uh, or have it go through uh, the objects that we create in a uh, 3D space. So for example, maybe in a 3D space we see an UCR bell tower, right? Uh, and once the ray reach there, right, and the, the ray won't go straight, right, Physic uh, according to the physics series, right? It would have like reflection, it would have like uh, re refraction, it would have a lot of uh, different uh, physical phenomenon, which I cannot even tell you what are those because it has been uh, a long time ago since my uh, general physics class at undergrad. And if I'm good at that, I won't be here, right? So, uh, so the thing is that, okay, we got, so for example, here we have a reflection, right? And when, once you reach the reflection, you know that, okay, you are not going through this one, right? In fact, uh, the light will have will create something like a shadow or something. Maybe some shadow will be reflected here, right? Or so you probably will see like the shape of a cloud or part of the shape of the cloud um, on the bell tower, right? 
In the meantime, some of the lights are in different angle, uh, diffusion or something. They would go to, uh, they would uh, have a direct path to other light sources. So that's pretty much the idea of ray tracing. Uh, so the ray tracing idea is basically trace back to the root of all potential light source of 3D objects. So you might think, okay, if in real physics, in real world, right, the trace is pretty much this, right? It goes through here, it goes through here, goes through here, and goes through, also go into my eye. That's what I see, right? But why in ray tracing algorithm we do things in this way? So the reason is, Clean, uh, is simple because we want to reduce the amount of computation. So even though, yes, we know in physics, uh, the light should come from the source instead of coming from our eyes because our eyes are not light generator. We are not ray generator, right? If we are ray generator, I think that must be one of the Marvel videos. Some of the superhero can do that, not us, right? But uh, the thing is that if you try to, uh, like imagine that a 3D object as a light source. And turns out that a lot of lights that the sun generated, for example, would actually not go into this display, right? So you are actually doing a lot of redundant computation. So what ray tracing algorithm is trying to do is that, okay, so because these are the lights that would be 100% for sure go into my eyes. So what, are the sources of uh, the lights that would uh, that would re that would create a result of the lights that I see, the image that I see, and I trace it back. So that's the ray tracing algorithm, right? So um, if you don't have the ray tracing algorithm, some stuff like the shadow is very hard to uh, to uh, create in a three D image, and you know the only well, I don't know how. Uh, well, the only thing that won't have a shadow in a light uh, in a in a lightning situation is probably the ghost, right? So, and uh, we are real human beings, so we we want to have shadows, right? So that's why shadows are so important. So, so here's the thing, right? So this is the, the and based on what I told you, right? This is the simple ray tracing algorithm. So basically, for every ray, you have to check if I would hit an object, and depending on uh, the shape of the object, the position of the object, uh, the light would have diffusion, it would have like refraction, it would have reflection, and then you will call a different function. However, it goes through, that's a different story, right? So that's pretty much uh, the ray tracing algorithm. So um, the question I'm asking you is that if you look at the ray tracing algorithm code, which I listed on the left hand side of the slide, why? Can we use GPUs for that purpose? Thank 
All right, looks like you guys are discussing like which course to take, right? <laughs> Instead of the ray tracing, so you probably have some idea. So what do you guys think? Well, GPU is so powerful, right? We even have tensor cores. Why do we have a separate ray tracing hardware? It's not spatialized, but uh, if the GPU can do a good job on it, why do we need a spatialized hardware? Power consumption, okay, what else? Okay, yes. So here's the thing, right? If you look at the code, there are so many if here, right? So like if object, oops, right? If you look at the code, right? So um, although, okay, so a few things to say, right? What code is good for GPU? Uh, a code with uh, a for loop, that's typically good, right? But what's not good for a GPU application? A code with if, right? So if you have a code with if, and what's going on in the if would change a lot, right? Like this, I have if, and there is also if under if, right? So it turns out that, and the thing is that they also call different computation, different functions if I see the if, right? So this kind of, uh, people say like branch divergence or control flow divergence code is bad for GPUs. And why is that? If you look at the design of GPU, which I forgot to attach, and I don't know if this one has it. Um, okay, so this one doesn't have it. So uh, in modern GPU architecture, if you remember, if you remember the modern GPU architecture, they are pretty much uh, like, okay, I have a joint array of uh, like AOUs, you guys remember that, right? Like integer floating point and finally tensor cores, right? You remember that, right? So that's the giant array of computer AOUs. However, if you see carefully, they ha also have a BPU, branch, branch unit. However, the BPU is above all of them. So which means that, okay, it, if, I, if you give me an array of data to compute, I can only control all of them uh, under one branch. So if they have different branch behavior um, between, among each unit, each element in this array, the GPU cannot do them all at once. They, can, they, they need to separate uh, the execution of this. So it's not going to be effective. In fact, for this piece of code, they have if under if, so you can consider uh, the situation is going to be more complicated. So that's why ray tracing is, is not a good fit for any like SIMD architecture. Uh, for example, like it's not possible to be accelerated by uh, SIMD instructions by Intel. It's not possible to be accelerated by vector processing model like GPUs. Needless to say, uh, tensor cores because it's basically now, it's even worse because now it's controlling the whole matrices with one branch unit. However, what we want here is that every pixel may have a different uh, direction in a control flow. So this would not work well in modern GPU architecture, and nor the modern tensor core architecture. And because this is so important, so we need to have a separate ray tracing hardware. And uh, generally, there are many parts of the ray tracing, however, uh, most of the ray tracing hardware right now is focusing on this bounding volume tree traversal, uh, bounding volume hierarchical tree traversal. And uh, this tree is basically uh, with this, well, so here I just, I just want to simplify it. But you can consider each 
uh, object, they have their coordinates. And each bounding box also have their coordinates. And uh, the idea of a bounding volume hierarchical tree is basically they try to create like a binary tree style uh, structure in which we try to separate objects uh, as the leaf nodes in this binary tree. And then we try to figure out the best way to structure the tree in a way that uh, each internal node is like a bounding box that contain half a, a set of the objects in this scenario. So for example, uh, in here I have a total of uh, eight objects. So the first thing that I will have to do is that I separate uh, these objects into two groups. So each of them would get four. So that's why we create this N2 and N3. And uh, the, each N2 and N3, um, you see they have four, 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 four corners, right? So these four corners would define the coordinates of this A, A, B, B, uh, uh, like uh, axis aligned bounding boxes, like the coordinates of their bounding boxes. So every time when I have a ray, right, if I have a ray shoot into this place, I would check uh, the angle of this ray and check to see if, based on the angle of this ray, would it hit any of the bounding box. So for this one, right, apparently it will hit the N2, right? So uh, when I want to check if there is an intersection uh, between this ray and the objects, once I figure out this is hit into N2, I can pretty much forget about everything in the other part, which is N3, right? So I don't have to check if there would be an intersection with uh, the object in uh, belong, belong to N3. Now, later on, I also ch I continuously check uh, the ray position and figure out that, okay, this is going to hit N4. And for N2, right, I also have two other bounding boxes that belong to this one, N2 and N4 and N5. And turns out M4 is the one it will hit into. So I can pretty much forget about O3 and O4 belongs to um, M5, right? So the only thing that I need to check if they will have intersect with the object and uh, it is O1 and O2. And turns out I found it's O1, right? So all you need to do is to compute uh, the situation that I need to deal with on O1. So that's the, that's the, and this, Tree traversal, right? Apparently, is the most time-consuming part in modern ray tracing algorithm. Uh, and as you can see, because you are traversing a tree, so there are a lot of branch divergence. Because sometimes I don't know if I should go left, if I should go to the right child, right? So this is something that GPU doesn't do well. And in fact, any kind of graph algorithm based on tree traversal is something that GPU is weak for. So it's hard to hear people saying that I do like uh, some kind of complex tree, uh, uh, well, uh, traversal with uh, GPU. So a lot of data structures that you guys learn is good for a CPU algorithm, but they are terrible for GPU algorithm for the sake, right? So that's why we need a separate class for uh, GPU programming, because if you want to have efficient data structure on GPUs, you might think differently. So uh, however, right, ray tracing cores is aware of this and we are also aware of that. So it's traditionally, when people want to do ray tracing, CPUs are more important than GPUs, right? And um, so two, two driving force why NVIDIA want to have an accelerator for ray tracing hardware first. Well, I don't want to that Intel earn more money, right? So I, I need to have my own weapon of uh, like executing ray tracing, right? Second, right? As you guys all know, the CPU performance improvement is way slower than the demand of the reality applications. So that's why it's better to have an accelerator uh, doing it. So that's why we have this ray tracing hardware that accelerate this tra tree traversal process. So uh, this is the whole idea of a ray tracing. So now um, you might be wondering, this paper that we read is the Turing architecture in 2018. So what's after? So if you look at what's after, right? So this is the most recent, uh, this is the data that I got from the most recent uh, Hopper architecture. So first of all, uh, as you read previously, 
NVIDIA's Tensor Cores only support a 16-bit operation, right? But as the last lecture, we read from uh, Google's TPU, right? 10 lessons learned from uh, four generations of uh, tensor processing unit. What do they tell you? Is this 16-bit enough? Not really, right? So that's why they develop a, a new format called TF32, which give you more uh, precision, higher precision than 16-bit, but also uh, could be as fast as 16-bit uh, tensor cores. And so that's why, uh, so, uh, and that's better for machine learning purpose. However, for inferences, we also uh, have, they are also inspired by uh, the success of edge TPUs and TPUs, uh, the inference version of the TPU, and realize that, well, we also need a specialized hardware for int A. So they also have a mode of int A in their hardware. And uh, in fact, if you check the, uh, the throughput data uh, carefully or um, some, um, um, and we use some of your architecture and circuit design knowledge, you can pretty much guess what's going on in TF32 and int A, as well as uh, FT16 uh, tensor cores is that they are all using the same tensor cores, but with different bits in exponent to support this operations. So essentially, this, they are all using the same tensor cores. But what's different is here. So in A100 and H100, you start to see tensor cores supporting FT64 uh, precision. So uh, we believe uh, they are implementing this FT64 as a separate tensor core unit. Because if you check, um, the, the uh, let me see, the flops that uh, you can check, right? Like for FT64, it's 33.5, right? But for FT16, it's uh, almost like uh, 1,000 teraflops. And for FT32, right, it's about this one. Uh, but, you know, FT32 is not something that they really support. So they, they basically support this one, TF32. Right, so these are actually something that the tensor core support. So if you look at that, right? Okay, oh sorry, uh, I got it wrong. So here is the thing, right? For FT16, uh, BF16, uh, TF32, right? Those are the same line of tensor cores, and you can see their throughput is pretty much aligned, right? Like uh, FP, TF32 is half of the BF16 uh, performance, and that's understandable because we need to use more bits. Uh, and have one more aggregation. Uh, however, if you look at FT64, it's terribly slow compared against others, right? So that's a very good uh, evidence that they implemented FT64 as a separate unit uh, compared against others. And so here's the thing, what's the driving force why uh, they need to implement FT64? And we do believe because you know NVIDIA, they want to win contract of those supercomputer builder national labs or high performance computing clusters. So your hardware needs to support high precision uh, computation and surprisingly matrix problems, they are very important. Like uh, a lot of people, they probably have a thesis on how to optimize matrix multiplications uh, regarding their performance, regarding their error behavior, whatever, right? So that's a very, very important topic in high performance computing since decades, right? So um, that, and it's needless to say the importance of that in real application. So that's why they would rather build a separate unit to fulfill uh, the uh, demand of that. So one recent development of the NVIDIA hardware is that, okay, now tensor cores may not only have one, you also, you also have like FT64, tensor cores that is dedicated for double floating point computation. And another one, which might also be interesting. So talking about the branch divergence, there is another important algorithm that has a lot of branch divergence. That is dynamic programming. The most popular algorithm, uh, so, sorry, the most popular algorithm uh, with a solution to a leak code problem, right? <laughs> So, you know, like, I don't know how many of you had this ex experience, but during the high schools or on the, uh, when, when we are pursuing, like, bachelor degree, um, 
uh, I was participating in a lot of like competitive programming. And uh, pretty much every problem that we met has a DP solution. So DP is a very useful algorithm. And if you know DP, you can pretty much win uh, every competitive programming crown. So uh, this is a very important algorithm. But remember the format of DP, right? We, we have to get the maximum, minimum. We have to check the if else, right? And depending on the if else, we have to optimize our solution differently. So it's also a branch divergence one. So turns out that the, last, the recent NVIDIA hardware, they also have a DPX uh, extension uh, to support dynamic programming problems. So these are the new development of the new NVIDIA uh, processor, uh, well, GPUs. As you can see, it's no more a GPU, right? Graphics is only part of it. It has ray tracing hardware. It has dynamic programming extension. It has 64-bit tensor cores. Right, so these are the new hardware acceleration that you can potentially take advantages when you are designing your applications. If you this hardware available are available to you, so one trend that we see in the media hardware development is that we are seeing um, pro, well graphic units are no more graphic units. In in fact, it becomes a set of accelerators, and graphic accelerator is only one of them. So this is not an exclusive trend to NVIDIA. In fact, if you have a recent version of the Intel processor, they also follow the same trend. So this is the building blocks of an, an Intel Elder Lake processor, which is the version of the processor that if you took my CS203 class or if you took this class, if you take this class, uh, the same cluster you will use. Uh, all processors are using the Elder Lake architecture. So the Elder Lake architecture is pretty much like this. So first of all, uh, they have different types of cores, uh, pro uh, uh, performance cores and efficient cores. And um, this is just like a big little core idea. So uh, the performance cores means faster cores, uh, the efficient cores means uh, uh, like slower cores, and they support different instructions on, um, they, have, they are different generations of Intel architectures, uh, to be honest. And, um, also, they have the second part of the building block. Again, right? this is the PCIe root, root complex that we are familiar with already. Um, they have an uh, integrated um, uh, graphics. We know it sucks, but uh, sometimes if you want to build a chip computer, that's what you rely on. And sometimes if you, if you want to have a lightweight laptop, that's what you would use. And another thing that is worth mentioning, this is the GNA, Gaussian Neural Accelerator. So they also have their own accelerator. Uh, and this Gaussian neural accelerator is pretty much designed for uh, signal processing. So uh, like Gaussian denoise uh, uh, or some kind of neural acceleration, that is uh, for uh, pretty much for video and uh, audio. So um, that's one of the accelerator they have. And they also have the GPU architecture uh, and also memory controller. So it turns out the Elder Lake processor is also a combination of general purpose core, uh, processor, uh, graphic processor core, and um, uh, an accelerator for AIML workloads. So um, that's pretty much it. And now, OK, we have seen GPUs and Intel CPUs. They become an SOC, which means that it's a chip with many other chips together or many other functional blocks put together. So do you think? is a good idea compared against like standalone accelerators like GPUs. Yeah, that's why I'm not 
All right, so Albert, I, I, I heard some interesting discussion from you. Why don't you share with? Um, so I think for the SOC, there is a very like good case of using them. Mm -hmm. That for most people, they don't need to have like the full maximum output. Mm. They don't. Uh, I think being able to oh make it easy so where you just have one plug and play mm -hmm. that you don't have to think about it. Oh, how does how do these accelerators connect to each other? Um, it's just okay. I have one thing. They all talk to each other. They all work in spec, mm -hmm. and it makes it a lot easier if you are a consumer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other thought? Hey, Suze, you said it depends, right? It depends. Okay, how how does that de it depends? Tell me more about it. Depends on the application. Tell me more about it. Mm hmm. So, uh, so you said if I, um, I I don't quite uh maybe I. Okay, one more time. Uh, like for example, if we need, uh, we need to run only one application. Okay, we need to only one, only one application. And then we can go for like standalone accelerator. We can go with standalone accelerator. What's the reason for that? Uh, like for example, we run like CNN, mm -hmm. and we need only like the accelerator to like, mm. like, make the computation. Mm. And then we can go for CPU. Mm -hmm. Like for example, we run application where we sometimes need to save the power. Mm -hmm. Then we can go for system on chip. Mm -hmm. Is chip system on chip okay? You can save. Is system on chip really more power efficient? What's their argument of TPUs versus GPUs? Right, so that's probably not true, right? And in fact, if you look at the NVIDIA GPU, because they have made it system on chip, so it turns out it's 700 watt, very power consuming, right? And in, uh, in contrast, a TPU, the latest version of TPU, I think its power consumption is about uh, 350 watt, half of it, right? So power consumption, I would argue that. <clears throat> So actually, I overheard from Albert. I think he has a very good analogy. Right? <laughs> Do you want to share that? Uh, a car yeah. Um, so what I, kind of a car do you have? Uh, so I have an electric car, but. Oh, what kind of electric car? A Bionic 5. 
once in a blue moon. Um, but, but the main idea is that for most people, they don't need to use the full throughput of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, just because you own the car doesn't mean you're going to be doing 120 miles per hour just because you can. Mm -hmm. And it isn't always, you don't always need to have everything. And you could realistically always add on things later. Mm. Okay. So here's the thing, right? When you want to buy a car, right? Because cars are expensive, right? So sometimes we have to think about, it's pretty much like a build a server in a data center, right? We are thinking of, or build a computer for, 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 for some situation. So pretty much you have to think about, what am I going to use this computer for? Or how am I going to use this car for, right? If you are in a family, right, you might think about, okay, I might have kids, so it needs to have the place for me to put a, a cart uh, for, for the baby, right, and it must have the holder for the baby sitting, right, uh, because you travel with family, so you need to have a very big luggage uh, space, right, and sometimes if you have more kids, you are thinking about, okay, it should be like a seven sitting car, right, and Sometimes you might be, well, but let's say about like, okay, not having a seven sitting car because I don't believe a lot of you would like to live with your parents, right? So, <laughs> and not having so many kids. So probably like a five people car with lot, uh, some space for the baby sitting is probably good enough, right? And sometimes you probably are thinking about, we can go camping, we can go some other places, we can have a road trip, right? And it must be spacious. Okay, what kind of car are you going to buy? SUV, what kind of SUV? Maybe a Toyota RAV4, right? And okay, I want it to be energy efficient, right? So okay, hybrid co to Toyota RAV4, right? And because I want to do road trips, so it won't be Tesla Model Y for sure, <laughs> right? So, so that's how we make decision of the car, right? However, if you are a diehard camping lover, right? The reason why I want to have a car is because I want to camp within. I want to live within there. What kind of car are you going to get? Uh, still an SUV. Are you sure you are not going up to an RV? Well, what if you want to go like off road? Off road it. Run off road. Oh, okay. I never thought about that. <laughs> right. You probably want a Jeep, right? Okay. So different car, right? <laughs> right. Right, but if what, <laughs> yeah, you want it to be reliable, okay, not cheap for sure, right? Okay, so if my hobby is that I want to enjoy, like, you know, playing games with the police, what kind of car am I going to get? Maybe Porsche, right? Yeah, a car that can drive really fast, right? And that would catch the police eye better to paint it in red, right? Something like that, right? But if today, Okay, the only reason I want to have a car is grocery shopping. What kind of car should I get? Uh, Corolla. Corolla, right? Toyota Corolla, that's the car, right? But uh, can you hold a baby in Corolla? You can still hold a baby in Corolla, right? But can you road trip with a Corolla? With a few people, yes, right? So it still can do the job, but not so well. That's pretty much like the situation of SOC, right? Like, okay. Um, like I said, right, if you have an integrated graphics in your uh, Intel CPU, you can still play games like Cyberpunk, right? But it won't be really good, right? But if you are just playing LOL, that's good enough, right? Oh yeah, right, that's good enough, right? So, so, so here's the thing, right? So sometimes it's really application dependent. And the limitation of SOC is because it's pretty much like a RAV4, which I would say, right? Uh, a better analogy, right? Because I would say Corolla is like a very low end Intel CPU, right? And a, an SOC, a high end SOC is pretty much like a RAV4 in a way that you can pretty much do everything with it. You can do machine learning with it. However, it won't be the best machine, fastest machine to do machine learning. Uh, how, uh, oh, oh, but I have to, uh, I have to take that set it a little bit back is that if you are able to like make this raffle really large really powerful right like what nvidia does is like it allow the 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 gpu to take 700 watt then you can definitely make this a very very uh powerful uh horse for uh, everything right 
However, if you only have limited budget, that's typically the case for an SOC, then um, you can run a workload in a distant situation, but it would never be as good as a dedicated standalone accelerator, uh, given the same power budget, right? So the same thing, right? Like, okay, why GPU can deliver higher throughput than NVIDIA GPUs in general uh, with less, uh, if you give them the same power budget or if you are willing to pay the same electricity bill because it's more specialized, right? So that's the, that's the, that's the strength of a standalone accelerator. On the other hand, another benefit I can see from a standalone accelerator, which because they are separate hardware units, so the heat won't be aggregated together as a single chip. And typically, if you want to build a powerful SOC like NVIDIA's GPU, uh, then what end up is that you have to spend a lot of cost in cooling, right? And 10 lessons learned from Google's experience of building GPUs, they want, they already tell you, uh, air cooling is more favorable, right? So if you go with the way that NVIDIA suggests, it's probably not going through, right? Okay, so uh, here are a few thoughts that I have, right? Potentially reduce the interconnection bandwidth, as some of you mentioned, I heard from some of your, uh, because uh, if it's the same chip, you don't have to go through the PCIe. So potentially faster. However, another thing to think about is that, okay, ray tracing hardware, they have different memory pattern. GPU has different memory pattern. CPU code has different memory pattern. Then how are you going to design a memory controller that fits all? So that's a different story too, right? So there are many, 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 many things that we can talk about. However, uh, I think a uh, good answer is it depends. However, uh, and one thing important is that um, why we still have standalone GPUs? Why we still have, why Google made TPU standalone? Because uh, if we really want to specialize for a certain application, for a certain work, certain type of workload, standalone is probably the way to go, all right? So um, now, uh, okay, so an, uh, I would probably uh, fast going through. So another thing that you might be interesting is about, okay, how are we going to access the feature of this hardware accelerators? So for NVIDIA's Tensor Cores, uh, they have the WMMA interface, and uh, the MMA apparently is the uh, matrix uh, multiplication and accumulation. So pretty much their idea is that you use this WMMA interface, you can load the matrix, and then uh, uh, and then perform uh, like this is MMA synchronization, the synchronized MMA operation, which would aggregate uh, the multiplication result together into your result. And that's pretty much how you call and then store the result back to the final, right? So that's their interface, uh, pretty low level, however, uh, this low level give you the power of directly control the hardware, which is not bad. And this is probably I hate the most, and probably one of the reasons why uh, GNA doesn't really uh, work out is because uh, they leverage the open uh, CL syntax, and turns out if you want to call a function of uh, uh, of, of GNA, you have to do a lot of preparation before you can actually do it. So this is just an idea regarding what kind of function interface GNA is providing. I'm not asking you to learn from them. So um, uh, summary, uh, accelerators, they can lift up the roof line and the most system design must land on the turning point of your mo roof line model, right? So that's the, that's the takeaway of that. Okay, so, um, Let's look at another paper that uh, we have been talking, uh, we have been assigning to read, which uh, I am supposed to talk about this in the last lecture, but we are a little bit slower, but it's slower in a good way, right? So this is the, this is a paper from my, Microsoft. They are talking about uh, their cloud scale acceleration architecture. But before we talk about that, right? Uh, I know a lot of you hate this, but you must remember, if you want to implement a half adder, right? Uh, you, you need a circuit like this, right? Uh, okay, so I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but if you remember, right, how we know there, uh, the, he, here's the truth map of this circuit, right? So if you give them uh, both input as zero, you will get result zero, carry as zero, right? If you give them both one, result zero, carry one, right? So, and based on this is the output we want, so we designed the circuit in this way. 
So that's one way of implementing the circuit. However, another thought about this, right? What if I use the input as a memory address and the corresponding cell will store the result and the carry for this address, right? So pretty much you can train and use SRANs to keep this uh, result, right? So pretty much you are implementing the algorithm or say the, uh, the hardware circuit with memory, uh, with memory content, right? So if I'm looking for uh, the input for one, uh, the result for one one, right? Then this, you can consider one one as the memory address. Then you just go to this and you will get a result of zero one. So every, every circuit could be translated into a lookup table. Right, every set of circuit could be translated into a lookup table. So that's actually the basic idea why FPGA works, is that I look, oh, I, I synthesize the whole circuit. I figure out what are the truth tables that are necessary to implement an algorithm. And then I make up lookup tables for each part of the circuit. So when you run this algorithm, it's probably, it's pretty much going through a set of lookup tables to get the result of running, uh, of executing uh, the circuit, uh, is uh, like running signals on each, uh, on each circuit. However, because again, right, the S rank context can be changed every time, right? Like you can refresh the S rank context. So once you refresh the S rank context, it could implement a completely different set of circuits, right? You, if you refresh the context of a lookup table, it's pretty much implementing a different set of circuits. So in this way, you can hear that, okay, I have a feeling that, okay, if I give a, an SRAN, like a set of memory with a set of lookup table, it's pretty much implement a circuit, right? And if I change the content of this lookup tables, they would represent a different set of circuits, right? So what does that tell you is that it's possible to implement reconfigurable hardware with simply SRAN cells and a set of connections that redirect the outputs of this lookup tables. And that's the basic idea of FPGA. So it's basically containing an array of lookup tables and the wires could be reconfigurable because you want to redirect uh, the output to different, uh, as the input of different lookup tables. And each part of the lookup table is representing a circuit in real, right? So that's how FPGA works. So, um, so you can, so pretty much you can use FPGAs and the lookup tables to emulate any kind of circuits, right? Depending on how big, uh, well, as long as it fits in the SRAM storage of the FPGA. So that's the basic idea of FPGA. And FPGA uh, is pretty much like this. This is an Altera FPGA, and as you can see, it's also a standalone card. So. Uh, what Microsoft did is that they actually put FPGAs associated with each of the server. So each server, uh, and this is, uh, uh, don't, don't, so don't be, don't be uh, fooled, well, not say fool. Don't, don't get confused about their hierarchy. So this is like a, this is like a, a label, a label two, uh, this is, this is their network hierarchy. So this is like a level two switch, level one switch, top of rack switch. Right, so this is the switch that connects all the machine because they have a fat tree architecture for their data center network. So that's pretty much means that. And uh, so this only tells you that they have a well thousands of machines connected in a fat tree architecture. And uh, for each of the machine, well, although they say it's a hardware acceleration plan, but it's just a term that they try to fascinate you with the new idea, right? But um, in fact, this hardware acceleration plan is meaning that each machine, the, the FPGA of each machine. And why are they saying this is a hardware acceleration plan? It's because what they did is that actually, when, uh, and um, actually, if you look at their architecture, this FPGA is attached to each of the server machine. And uh, the top of a rack, um, top of rack, uh, the, the wire from the top of rack switch is actually going into the FPGA first before they go into the machine. So in this way, the FPGA can inter intersect all the traffic going into the machine 
before the machine start processing it. And uh, what what what's the reason why they want to do that? Because uh, as you can see, they want to use this FPGA associated with each machine to perform some spatialized tasks using the hardware uh, circuit that they implemented in the FPGA. So uh, if you are having a packet or some kind of command or some kind of data that is dedicated for the FPGA, it should not go into the server. Otherwise, you are, you are uh, like uh, intensify the traffic within the server. So here, the FPGA would, insert, it would in, intersect those traffic or workloads that dedicated to it. And only those that is not relevant to the FPGA would go to the regular network interface card uh, as well as the machine itself. And sometimes the FPGA can also, as you can see here, the FPGA also have a TCIE connection to the server itself. So sometimes it can also offload stuff from the, the server that it's attaching to. So that's the, that's the hardware architecture of this FPGA, uh, how they use FPGA in the data center. So they can offload workloads in two ways. So first, for the machine they attach, they can grab workloads from the server through the PCIe. For the workloads from other machines, they can get this from the network. So that's how they do it. And the FPGA, based on how you configure it, it could be web searching, it could be SQL, it could be deep neural networks. Okay, so that's a base, basic idea. So um, now, based on what you learned from the paper, why Microsoft choose to use FPGA instead of using TPUs or building their own accelerators? You guys have been quiet. What do you guys think? Save money because it's such a good thing. 
update it. You can just update it. It saves money. Do you know how expensive is an FPGA? Oh, uh, uh, I don't know. It varies. <laughs> um, so for the data center class FPGA, like a um, Xilinx U200, it would cost 5900 5, Yeah. Still cheaper than a GPU, right? And plus, it's an FPGA, so you can uh, reprogram it, right? It's more long term, right? So long term capital cost is low, right? Okay, so huh, interestingly, what you remember from the 10 lessons learned from tensor processing unit? Did they say anything about the capital cost? They were talking about the operational cost versus capital cost, right? So Microsoft, as you can tell right here, I'm looking at the FPGA to uh, reduce the long-term capital cost because it can be reconfigurable, right? However, Google tells you that's wrong. It should be uh, operational cost more important, right? But uh, so that's why sometimes looking at different papers, they have different perspectives, right? So that we can verify that later, right? But capital cost, long-term capital cost, all right? What else? Scalability, tell me more about it. Mm -hmm. But I can also like connect many, many GPUs as a, as a grid, right? Which GPU V4 does. Well, depends. You can also configure the GPU speed to be really higher, right? That's depending on the network interface that you are attaching to, right? Not the computing unit itself, right? Mm, true, okay. But FPGA, neither, right? What else? <coughs> Why FPGAs? Mm -hmm. uh, was that the way Microsoft has it set up mm -hmm. is that any unused resource is allowed to be donated. Mm -hmm. So like they're able to basically maximize all resources available mm -hmm. at all times, mm -hmm. which is like not doable with a normal GPU. Right. And also like if you have a GPU, right, the only thing it can do is to accelerate machine learning, right? But if today the user is using something for different from machine learning, there's nothing we can do with it, right? So. <laughs> If I want to find one word for the reason why Microsoft would like to have an FPGA instead of a is, instead of their own accelerators, what's that one word? Efficiency. What else? What? Balance. Programmability. Flexibility. Right. That's a better word. So. The model offers significant flexibility. They must be highly flexible, uh, sufficiently flexible, uh, sufficient flexibility, uh, scalable, flexible, right? So if you find a word they use the most, it's probably flexible, right? The reason why they want the FPGA is just because it's flexible, right? But uh, is okay if FPGA is so flexible, why don't why other companies don't use FPGAs instead, right? Why Google built TPUs? They want it for specific tasks. What else? It's a little bit related to the 10 lessons they learned. Lower power. Um, is it just power? It's the energy, right? So, but what's related to the energy? So what's the difference between power and energy? Time, right? So is FPGA faster than TPU? Not really, right? So is FPGA faster than CPU? It depends, right? So. <laughs> Accelerated networking. Okay, some of you are saying about okay, uh, it's really fast. And in fact, in Microsoft data centers as well as Google data centers, they encrypt every pa packet. So uh, and 
So here's the thing, right? The very first thing that you have to do before your computation is that you have to decrypt data. And okay, here's the performance of FPGA in decryption. It takes 11 microse uh, microseconds. However, on a CPU, four mi microseconds, right? CPU is twice more faster than an FPGA. But why do you want FPGAs? Because it just saves the CPU for other things. So, but in fact, if you consider, okay, but that's just the network part, right? And in fact, so that's why I want to counter argue you, because if you use the FPGA to process network packets, it's actually going to be slower than G CPUs, right? So FPGA is slower. However, uh, it offloads the CPU for more workloads that FPGA cannot do even more efficiently, right? So FPGA is essentially, well, I want to say, I mean, I'm sad about to say this, but a lot of professors are probably going to be really sad because they offer class in FPGA, they do research in FPGA. But if someone tell you FPGA is really fast, it can accelerate a lot of things better than GPUs, no. Depending on what kind of workload they are talking about. But for machine learning, definitely a no, right? So that's why, um, for that kind of workload, TPU is the way to go, right? The NVIDIA's tensor course is the way to go, not the FPGA, right? And in fact, a um, long time ago, both Intel and AMD, they acquired an FPGA company. Intel acquired an Altera, AMD acquired Xilinx. However, uh, years passed, do you see they earn money from those business? The answer is no, right? And in fact, people are aware that FPGA is not going to be, uh, be the solution. It's a little bit older, over exaggerated if you are, uh, especially for the workloads that we are uh, talking about today, right? So that's why FPGA, uh, the only reason why Microsoft won the FPGA, as you said, is the long-term capital cost. I can reconfigure it for different uh, uh, tasks. However, uh, in terms of the uh, operational cost, which 10 lessons learned from uh, tensor processing unit tells you, FPGA is actually going to be higher because a task would be slower, it takes longer time, and FPGA is also uh, relatively power consuming. So, because it's, if you think about it, it's all SREN, right? So SREN itself, it takes, uh, it takes power to retain the content in there, so it's not going to be really, really low power, right? Uh, so the only thing it can do is to offload the CPUs and uh, being able to support uh, other units to that them not stress out, right? So it's pretty much like a, maybe like a grad student uh, uh, advisor relationship, right? So sometimes, okay, uh, a lot of the things if I do uh, will be faster. I still ask my PhD students to do because if I do everything, right, I cannot get everything done. But if somebody can help me, we can all get something done, right? So. Uh, that's pretty much the role of FPGA in data centers. But some people would have the misunderstanding, uh, consider as FPGA as an accelerator. I don't believe that's the case, right? So uh, I personally would think FPGA as a decelerator, but it's an offloading uh, computation unit. All right, so um, a lot of you were talking about like how long do you want the paper summary to be? with this class would be really, really stressful, right? And I said one of the soft skills that I wanted to learn is that how do you read a paper within an hour, right? How much time you spend in reading the papers? It depends on the time. Uh, it depends on the time you have. So for the MPU paper, uh, how much time you spend? MPU? Like the, the, the neural acceleration. Uh, Okay. Oh, okay. That paper, how much time? Uh, maybe 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay, that's a good good amount. How about others? How much time you spend on those papers? One hour. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, sounds like you guys are good paper readers, but uh, let me, uh, I still want to use the teach the way how I parse the paper. So, First of all, each paper, and also it's important when you write a paper, um, each paper, uh, we have three parts of the elements. Why, what, and how. So the why is the more, most important thing of a research paper, 
right? Um, so sometimes you can probably, once you do Google search, like scholar.google.com, right? You want to find a paper, you want to know if the paper is related to the topic that I care about. Then the most important thing is that what kind of problem this paper is trying to address, right? So that's the why of the paper. And why should I, as a reader, care about this paper? So for example, um, if, okay, like, okay, if I'm reading a paper and today I'm caring about machine learning applications, but uh, specifically like neural networks, right? But this paper, yeah, it's machine learning, however, is dealing with SVN, then I probably won't care about this paper, right? And once I identify that, I can pretty much um, shelf the paper instead of going dip, right? So the very first thing that you need to identify in a paper is the why. And, uh, and it's also important, right, if you want to write a paper, right, you want to make all readers, all reviewers feel like this is a paper that I care about, right? Then, well, so one thing that, well, interesting, like uh, one thing that attorney tell me, right, uh, if you are an immigrant, uh, if you want to apply for a green card, what kind of research would get 100% approval rate of getting a green card? Do you want to make a guess? Not quantum. High tech? <laughs> Weapons? Okay, so he said cancer. Right? And, well, I like, you know, the reviewer, he might, or she, or they might be using like an iPhone 8, right? I don't care about high tech, right? Needless to say, oh, what is quantum computing? How does that relate to my life, right? No, cancer, yes, I might get cancer in the future. Maybe some of the family in his, uh, of, of the reviewers get cancer before, right? So cancer is something that everyone would feel related, right? So again, as you write papers, you need to figure out if there is a way you can feel that paper is relevant to all your readers, all your reviewers, right? So that's the that's the that's the that's the important thing that you have to identify uh, when you write a research paper. On the other way, uh, every research paper should have an element like that, right? Talking about why this paper is addressing a big issue, big problem, right? That's what we want to know to see if this paper is relevant. And a second part of the paper is the what. The what is regarding what has been proposed by this paper. There may be multiple papers addressing the same problem. How does this paper distinguish from others? That's the what part, right? What are the novel ideas, novel solution, novel system design this paper provides? And um, most of the time, as grad students, when you write papers, you will focus on this part. But this is actually the least important part. And most of the time, if you have good technical background, you don't even need to read the how part. You already can imagine how can I make this happen, right? So this is the, these are the three important elements of a paper. However, this is still important in a way that uh, in papers, we have a lot of experiments. So you want to make the critical readers believe this has been done with a uh, very soundness proof of concept, right? So this part is still important as a paper. Okay, so use the, the, the philosophy that we got. Um, maybe we can take a look of the paper to figure out the why of neural acceleration for general purpose approximate programs. So when we read this paper, where can I find a why of this paper? Abstract, okay. So what did you learn from the abstract? Spatialized hardware. Okay, they are not general, right? What else? You can take advantage of approximations. Okay, you guys really get a why. Uh, I didn't think uh, the abstract is the best place. Uh, however, I think the introduction 
right, is a good play, right? If you take a look of the introduction, the first two paragraphs actually give you those, right? And if you dig into more detail, they actually tell you like this, right? Programming accelerators are uh, are good in terms of performance, and they also criticize uh, the FPGAs a little bit, right? Like FPGAs, uh, they 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 uh, they are not. Uh, I think they say something uh, that's about uh, the efficiency of the FPGA, right? And uh, um, GPUs, right? They can only exploit SIMD parallelism, but they have limited uh, capacity on other workloads, right? Uh, so some application they allow approximation. So it turns out these are the older ways uh, we we want to take care of we want to care about this paper, right? Accelerators they are energy efficient, hard to program. Uh, FPGA uh, are slow if the memory access is frequent. In fact, a lot of applications needs memory access, right? So FPGA is slow on that way. And GPU doesn't work well if the workload is not regular. And many many applications tolerate exact computation. So what I propose. Okay, so here's the thing, right? So they introduce a new class of programming accelerators and they propose a set of framework, right? And the basic idea is what? Replacing an algorithm with a machine learning model that approximate that algorithm, right? That's the whole idea of MPU, right? And uh, to do this, you need some kind of a learning algorithm to train the model that would replace the algorithm. And you need some kind of language compilation framework, architectural interface, right? So that's their proposal, right? And this is the whole workflow of the paper. So at this point, can you imagine how are you going to make this happen in your real life? Okay, uh, we can we can have this question uh, answered in a next week and actually I already have a demo for it. So look forward to it and uh, also put this question in your mind. Let's try to answer it at the beginning of the next lecture. And again, um, don't forget to make an appointment if you form a group because I want to confirm that each group has a different topic. And uh, for some of you uh, already met me, you, you already know that sometimes I give you feedback, not because, uh, it's mainly because I want to make sure that uh, you are working on something that could be done within 10 weeks and I want to make sure that each of you have something to do before uh, to make a progress because what I really want is that okay after you take this class you learn something rather than okay uh, I have a project that is not being done right so uh, it's important to form your group confirm your topic uh, with me and make an appointment uh, other than that uh, don't forget to submit a paper summary and we are going to continue our discussion on the neural net acceleration uh, for general purpose approximate computing next week. Other than that, enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, I will see you next Tuesday. Uh huh.